The Prague Spring Czech, Praské Jaro, Slovak, Praské Jar, was a period of political liberalization in Czechoslovakia as a communist state after World War II. It began on 5 January 1968, when reformist Alexander Dubček was elected first secretary of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia and continued until 21 August 1968 when the Soviet Union and other members of the Warsaw Pact invaded the country to suppress the reforms. The Prague Spring reforms were a strong attempt by Dubček to grant additional rights to the citizens of Czechoslovakia in an act of partial decentralization of the economy and democratization. The freedoms granted included a loosening of restrictions on the media, speech and travel. After national discussion of dividing the country into a federation of three republics, Bohemia, Moravia Silesia and Slovakia, Dubček oversaw the decision to split into two, the Czech Socialist Republic and Slovak Socialist Republic. This dual federation was the only formal change that survived the invasion. The reforms, especially the decentralization of administrative authority, were not received well by the Soviets, who, after failed negotiations, sent half a million Warsaw Pact troops and tanks to occupy the country. The New York Times cited reports of 650,000 men equipped with the most modern and sophisticated weapons in the Soviet military catalog. A large wave of emigration swept the nation. Nonviolent resistance was mounted throughout the country, involving attempted fraternization, sabotage of street signs, defiance of curfews, etc. While the Soviet military had predicted that it would take four days to subdue the country, the resistance held out for eight months until it was finally circumvented by diplomatic stratagems. See below. It became a high profile example of civilian based defense. There were sporadic acts of violence and several protest suicides by self immolation, the most famous being that of Jan Palach, but no military resistance. Czechoslovakia remained controlled by the Soviet Union until 1989, when the Velvet Revolution peacefully ended the communist regime. The last Soviet troops left the country in 1991. After the invasion, Czechoslovakia entered a period known as normalization. Subsequent leaders attempted to restore the political and economic values that had prevailed before Dubček gained control of the Kish. Gustav Husik, who replaced Dubček as first secretary and also became president, reversed almost all of the reforms. The Prague Spring inspired music and literature including the work of Václav Havel, Karol Husa, Karol Krill and Milan Kundera's novel The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Topic. Background. The process of destalinization in Czechoslovakia had begun under Antonin Novotny in the late 1950s and early 1960s, but had progressed more slowly than in most other states of the Eastern Bloc. Following the lead of Nikita Khrushchev, Novotny proclaimed the completion of socialism, and the new constitution accordingly adopted the name Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. The pace of change, however, was sluggish. The rehabilitation of Stalinist era victims, such as those convicted in the Slansky trials, may have been considered as early as 1963, but did not take place until 1967. In the early 1960s, Czechoslovakia underwent an economic downturn. The Soviet model of industrialization applied poorly to Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was already quite industrialized before World War II and the Soviet model mainly took into account less developed economies. Novotny's attempt at restructuring the economy, the 1965 new economic model, spurred increased demand for political reform as well. 1960–1970 As the strict regime eased its rules, the Union of Czechoslovak Writers cautiously began to air discontent, and in the Union's Gazette, Literary Noviny, members suggested that literature should be independent of party doctrine. In June 1967, a small fraction of the Czech Writers' Union sympathized with radical socialists, specifically Ludvik Vakulik, Milan Kundera, Jan Prohaska, Antonin Yaroslav Lim, Pavel Koout, and Ivan Klima. A few months later, at a party meeting, it was decided that administrative actions against against the writers who openly expressed support of reformation would be taken. Since only a small part of the Union held these beliefs, the remaining members were relied upon to discipline their colleagues. Control over literary noviny and several other publishing houses was transferred to the Ministry of Culture, and even members of the party who later became major reformers—including Dubček—endorsed these moves. 
Dubček's rise to power As President Antonin Novotny was losing support, Alexander Dubček, first secretary of the Regional Communist Party of Slovakia, and economist Oda Sik challenged him at a meeting of the Central Committee. Novotny then invited the Secretary General of the Communist Party of Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev, to Prague that December, seeking support, but Brezhnev was surprised at the extent of the opposition to Novotny and thus supported his removal as Czechoslovakia's leader. Dubček replaced Novotny as first secretary on 5 January 1968. On of March 1968, Novotny resigned his presidency and was replaced by Ludvík Svoboda, who later gave consent to the reforms. Early signs of change were few. When the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia Presidium member Joseph Smirkovsky was interviewed in a Rudé Pravo article, entitled, What Lies Ahead? He insisted that Dubček's appointment at the January plenum would further the goals of socialism and maintain the working class nature of the Communist Party. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Literary Listy. However, right after Dubček assumed power, the scholar Eduard Goldstucker became chairman of the Union of Czechoslovak Writers and thus editor-in-chief of the previously hard-line communist weekly literary Novini, which under Novotny had been filled with party loyalists. Goldstucker tested the boundaries of Dubček's devotion to freedom of the press when he appeared on a television interview as the new head of the union. On 4 February, in front of the entire nation, he openly criticized Novotny, exposing all of Novotny's previously unreported policies and explaining how they were preventing progress in Czechoslovakia. Despite the official government statement that allowed for freedom of the press, this was the first trial of whether Dubček was serious about reforms. Goldstucker suffered no repercussions, and Dubček instead began to build a sense of trust among the media, the government, and the citizens. It was under Goldstucker that the journal's name was changed to Literary Listy, and on 29 February 1968, the Writers' Union published the first copy of the censor-free Literary Listy. By August 1968, Literary Listy had a circulation of 300,000, making it the most published periodical in Europe. Topic. Socialism with a human face On the 20th anniversary of Czechoslovakia's victorious February, Dubček delivered a speech explaining the need for change following the triumph of socialism. He emphasized the need to enforce the leading role of the party more effectively, and acknowledged that, despite Clement Gottwald's urgings for better relations with society, the party had too often made heavy-handed rulings on trivial issues. Dubček declared the party's mission was to build an advanced socialist society on sound economic foundations a socialism that corresponds to the historical democratic traditions of Czechoslovakia, in accordance with the experience of other communist parties." One of the most important steps towards the reform was the reduction and later abolition of the censorship on 4 March 1968. It was for the first time in Czech history the censorship was abolished and it was also probably the only reform fully implemented, albeit only for a short period. From the instrument of parties propaganda media quickly became the instrument of criticism of the regime. In April, Dubček launched an action program of liberalizations, which included increasing freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and freedom of movement, with economic emphasis on consumer goods and the possibility of a multi-party government. The program was based on the view that, "...socialism cannot mean only liberation of the working people from the domination of exploiting class relations, but must make more provisions for a fuller life of the personality than any bourgeois democracy." It would limit the power of the secret police and provide for the federalization of the CSSR into two equal nations. The program also covered foreign policy, including both the maintenance of good relations with Western countries and cooperation with the Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc nations. It spoke of a 10-year transition through which democratic elections would be made possible and a new form of democratic socialism would replace the status quo. Those who drafted the action program were careful not to criticize the actions of the post-war communist regime, only to point out policies that they felt had outlived their usefulness. For instance, the immediate post-war situation had required centralist and directive administrative methods to fight against the remnants of the bourgeoisie, since the antagonistic classes 
were said to have been defeated with the achievement of socialism, these methods were no longer necessary. Reform was needed for the Czechoslovak economy to join the scientific technical revolution in the world, rather than relying on Stalinist era heavy industry, labor power, and raw materials. Furthermore, since internal class conflict had been overcome, workers could now be duly rewarded for their qualifications and technical skills without contravening Marxism-Leninism. The program suggested it was now necessary to ensure important positions were filled by capable, educated socialist expert cadres in order to compete with capitalism. Although it was stipulated that reform must proceed under Kish direction, popular pressure mounted to implement reforms immediately. Radical elements became more vocal. Anti Soviet polemics appeared in the press on 26 June 1968. The Social Democrats began to form a separate party, and new unaffiliated political clubs were created. Party conservatives urged repressive measures, but Dubček counseled moderation and re emphasized Kish leadership. At the presidium of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia in April, Dubček announced a political program of socialism with a human face. In May, he announced that the 14th Party Congress would convene in an early session on 9 September. The Congress would incorporate the action program into the party statutes, draft a federalization law, and elect a new central committee. Dubček's reforms guaranteed freedom of the press, and political commentary was allowed for the first time in mainstream media. At the time of the Prague Spring, Czechoslovak exports were declining in competitiveness, and Dubček's reforms planned to solve these troubles by mixing planned and market economies. Within the party, there were varying opinions on how this should proceed. Certain economists wished for a more mixed economy while others wanted the economy to remain mostly planned. Dubček continued to stress the importance of economic reform proceeding under Communist Party rule. On the 27th of June, Ludvik Vakulik, a leading author and journalist, published a manifesto titled The 2000 Words. It expressed concern about conservative elements within the Kish and so-called foreign forces. Vakulik called on the people to take the initiative in implementing the reform program. Dubček, the party presidium, the National Front, and the cabinet denounced this manifesto. Topic. Publications and media Dubček's relaxation of censorship ushered in a brief period of freedom of speech and the press. The first tangible manifestation of this new policy of openness was the production of the previously hard-line communist weekly literary Novini, renamed Literary Listy. Freedom of the press also opened the door for the first honest look at Czechoslovakia's past by Czechoslovakia's people. Many of the investigations centered on the country's history under communism, especially in the instance of the Joseph Stalin period. In another television appearance, Goldstucker presented both doctored and undoctored photographs of former communist leaders who had been purged, imprisoned, or executed and thus erased from communist history. The Writers' Union also formed a committee in April 1968, headed by the poet Yaroslav Seifert, to investigate the persecution of writers after the communist takeover in February 1948 and rehabilitate the literary figures into the Union, bookstores and libraries, and the literary world. Discussions on the current state of communism and abstract ideas such as freedom and identity were also becoming more common. Soon, non-party publications began appearing, such as the trade union Daily Press Labor. This was also helped by the Journalists' Union, which by March 1968 had already persuaded the Central Publication Board, the government censor, to allow editors to receive uncensored subscriptions to foreign papers, allowing for a more international dialogue around the news. The press, the radio, and the television also contributed to these discussions by hosting meetings where students and young workers could ask questions of writers such as Goldstucker, Pavel Koout, and Jan Prohaska and political victims such as Joseph Smirkovsky, Zdenek Heisler, and Gustav Husik. Television also broadcast meetings between former political prisoners and the communist leaders from the secret police or prisons where they were held. Most importantly, this new freedom of the press and the introduction of television into the lives of everyday Czechoslovak citizens moved the political dialogue from the intellectual to the popular sphere. Topic. Soviet reaction Initial reaction within the communist bloc was mixed. 
Hungary's Janos Kader was highly supportive of Dubček's appointment in January, but Leonid Brezhnev and others grew concerned about Dubček's reforms, which they feared might weaken the position of the Communist bloc during the Cold War. At a meeting in Dresden, East Germany on 23 March, leaders of the Warsaw Five USSR, Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria and East Germany questioned a Czechoslovak delegation over the planned reforms, suggesting any talk of democratization was a veiled criticism of other policies. Vladislaw Gamolka and Janos Kader were less concerned with the reforms themselves than with the growing criticisms leveled by the Czechoslovak media, and worried the situation might be similar to the prologue of the Hungarian counter-revolution. Some of the language in April's Kish Action Program may have been chosen to assert that no counterrevolution was planned, but Kieran Williams suggests that Dubček was perhaps surprised at, but not resentful of, Soviet suggestions. The Soviet leadership tried to stop, or limit, the changes in the CSSR through a series of negotiations. The Soviet Union agreed to bilateral talks with Czechoslovakia in July at Sierna nad Tisu, near the Slovak Soviet border. At the meeting, from 29 July to 1 August, with attendance of Brezhnev, Alexei Kosygin, Nikolai Podgorny, Mikhail Suslov and others on the Soviet side and Dubček, Svoboda, Oldrich Cernik, Smirkovsky and others on the Czechoslovak side, Dubček defended the proposals of the reformist wing of the Kish while pledging commitment to the Warsaw Pact and Comic-Con. The Kish leadership, however, was divided between vigorous reformers Joseph Smirkovsky, Oldrich Cernik, and Frantisek Kriegel who supported Dubček, and conservatives Vasil Bilik, Drahomir Kolder, and Oldrich Sevestka who adopted an anti-reformist stance, Brezhnev decided on compromise. The Kish delegates reaffirmed their loyalty to the Warsaw Pact and promised to curb anti-socialist tendencies, prevent the revival of the Czechoslovak Social Democratic Party, and control the press more effectively. The Soviets agreed to withdraw their armed forces still in Czechoslovakia after maneuvers that June and permit the 9 September Party Congress, on 3 August representatives from the Warsaw Five and Czechoslovakia met in Bratislava and signed the Bratislava Declaration. The declaration affirmed unshakable fidelity to Marxism-Leninism and proletarian internationalism and declared an implacable struggle against «bourgeois» ideology and all «anti-socialist» forces. The Soviet Union expressed its intention to intervene in a Warsaw Pact country if a «bourgeois» system — a pluralist system of several political parties representing different factions of the capitalist class — was ever established. After the Bratislava Conference, the Soviet army left Czechoslovak territory but remained along its borders. Invasion As these talks proved unsatisfactory, the Soviets began to consider a military alternative. The Soviet Union's policy of compelling the socialist governments of its satellite states to subordinate their national interests to those of the Eastern Bloc through military force if needed, became known as the Brezhnev Doctrine. On the night of 20-21 August 1968, Eastern Bloc armies from four Warsaw Pact countries, the Soviet Union, Bulgaria, Poland and Hungary, invaded the CSSR. That night, 200,000 troops and 2,000 tanks entered the country. They first occupied the Ruzin International Airport, where air deployment of more troops was arranged. The Czechoslovak forces were confined to their barracks, which were surrounded until the threat of a counterattack was assuaged. By the morning of 21 August Czechoslovakia was occupied, neither Romania nor Albania took part in the invasion. Soviet command refrained from drawing upon East German troops for fear of reviving memories of the Nazi invasion in 1938. During the invasion by the Warsaw Pact armies, 72 Czechs and Slovaks were killed, 19 of those in Slovakia, 266 severely wounded and another 436 slightly injured. Alexander Dubček called upon his people not to resist. Nevertheless, there was scattered resistance in the streets. Road signs in towns were removed or painted over—except for those indicating the way to Moscow. Many small villages renamed themselves Dubček or Svoboda. Thus, without navigational equipment, the invaders were often confused. On the night of the invasion, the Czechoslovak Presidium declared that Warsaw Pact troops had crossed the border without the knowledge of the CSSR government, but the Soviet press printed an unsigned request, allegedly by Czechoslovak Party and state leaders, for immediate assistance, including assistance with armed forces. 
at the 14th Kish Party Congress conducted secretly, immediately following the intervention, it was emphasized that no member of the leadership had invited the intervention. More recent evidence suggests that conservative Kish members including Bilic, Sevestka, Kolder, Indra, and Kapik did send a request for intervention to the Soviets. The invasion was followed by a previously unseen wave of emigration, which was stopped shortly thereafter. An estimated 70,000 fled immediately with an eventual total of some 300,000. The Soviets attributed the invasion to the Brezhnev Doctrine, which stated that the USSR had the right to intervene whenever a country in the Eastern Bloc appeared to be making a shift towards capitalism. There is still some uncertainty, however, as to what provocation, if any, occurred to make the Warsaw Pact armies invade. Preceding the invasion was a rather calm period without any major events taking place in Czechoslovakia. Topic. Reactions to the invasion In Czechoslovakia, especially in the week immediately following the invasion, popular opposition was expressed in numerous spontaneous acts of nonviolent resistance. Civilians purposely gave wrong directions to invading soldiers, while others identified and followed cars belonging to the secret police. On 16 January 1969, student Jan Palach set himself on fire in Prague's Wenceslas Square to protest against the renewed suppression of free speech. The generalized resistance caused the Soviet Union to abandon its original plan to oust the first secretary. Dubček, who had been arrested on the night of 20 August, was taken to Moscow for negotiations. There, he and several other leaders including all the highest-ranked officials, President Svoboda, Prime Minister Cernik and Chairman of the National Assembly Smirkovsky signed the Moscow Protocol, under heavy psychological pressure from Soviet politicians, and it was agreed that Dubček would remain in office and a program of moderate reform would continue. On 25 August citizens of the Soviet Union who did not approve of the invasion protested in Red Square, seven protesters opened banners with anti-invasion slogans. The demonstrators were brutally beaten and arrested by security forces, and later punished by a secret tribunal. The protest was dubbed anti Soviet, and several people were detained in psychiatric hospitals. A more pronounced effect took place in Romania, where Nicolae Ceausescu, General Secretary of the Romanian Communist Party, already a staunch opponent of Soviet influences and a self declared Dubček supporter, gave a public speech in Bucharest on the day of the invasion, depicting Soviet policies in harsh terms. Albania withdrew from the Warsaw Pact in opposition, calling the invasion an act of social imperialism. In Finland, a country under some Soviet political influence, the occupation caused a major scandal. Like the Italian and French Communist parties, the majority of the Communist Party of Finland denounced the occupation. Nonetheless, Finnish President Jurho Kekkonen was the very first Western politician to officially visit Czechoslovakia after August 1968. He received the highest Czechoslovakian honors from the hands of President Ludvík Svoboda on the 4th of October 1969. The Portuguese Communist Secretary General Álvaro Cunhal was one of few political leaders from Western Europe to have supported the invasion for being counter-revolutionary, along with the Luxembourg Party and conservative factions of the Greek Party. Most countries offered only vocal criticism following the invasion. The night of the invasion, Canada, Denmark, France, Paraguay, the United Kingdom and the United States requested a meeting of the United Nations Security Council. At the meeting, the Czechoslovak ambassador Jan Muzik denounced the invasion. Soviet ambassador Jacob Malik insisted the Warsaw Pact actions were fraternal assistance against antisocial forces. One of the nations that most vehemently condemned the invasion was China, which objected furiously to the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine, declaring the Soviet Union alone had the right to determine what nations were properly communist and could invade those communist nations whose communism did not meet the Kremlin's approval. Mao Zedong saw the Brezhnev Doctrine as the ideological basis for a Soviet invasion of China, and launched a massive propaganda campaign condemning the invasion of Czechoslovakia, despite his own earlier opposition to the Prague Spring. Speaking at a banquet at the Romanian embassy in Beijing on 23 August 1968, the Chinese premier Zhou Enlai denounced the Soviet Union for "...fascist politics, great power chauvinism, national egoism and social imperialism." Going on to compare the invasion of Czechoslovakia to the American war in Vietnam and more pointedly to the policies of Adolf Hitler towards Czechoslovakia in 1938-39. 
Joe ended his speech with a barely veiled call for the people of Czechoslovakia to wage guerrilla war against the Red Army. The next day, several countries suggested a resolution condemning the intervention and calling for immediate withdrawal. Eventually, a vote was taken with ten members supporting the motion Algeria, India, and Pakistan abstained, the USSR with veto power and Hungary opposed. Canadian delegates immediately introduced another motion asking for a UN representative to travel to Prague and work toward the release of the imprisoned Czechoslovak leaders. By the 26th of August, a new Czechoslovak representative requested the whole issue be removed from the Security Council's agenda. Shirley Temple Black visited Prague in August 1968 to prepare for becoming the US ambassador for a free Czechoslovakia. However, after the 21st of August invasion she became part of a U.S. embassy organized convoy of vehicles that evacuated U.S. citizens from the country. In August 1989, she returned to Prague as U.S. ambassador, three months before the Velvet Revolution that ended 41 years of communist rule. <laughs> Aftermath In April 1969, Dubček was replaced as first secretary by Gustav Husik, and a period of normalization began. Dubček was expelled from the Kish and given a job as a forestry official. Husik reversed Dubček's reforms, purged the party of its liberal members, and dismissed from public office professional and intellectual elites who openly expressed disagreement with the political transformation. Husik worked to reinstate the power of the police and strengthen ties with the rest of the communist bloc. He also sought to re-centralize the economy, as a considerable amount of freedom had been granted to industries during the Prague Spring. Commentary on politics was forbidden in mainstream media, and political statements by anyone not considered to have full political trust were also banned. The only significant change that survived was the federalization of the country, which created the Czech Socialist Republic and the Slovak Socialist Republic in 1969. In 1987, the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev acknowledged that his liberalizing policies of glasnost and perestroika owed a great deal to Dubček's socialism with a human face. When asked what the difference was between the Prague Spring and Gorbachev's own reforms, a foreign ministry spokesman replied, 19 years. Dubček lent his support to the Velvet Revolution of December 1989. After the collapse of the communist regime that month, Dubček became chairman of the Federal Assembly under the Havel administration. He later led the Social Democratic Party of Slovakia, and spoke against the dissolution of Czechoslovakia prior to his death in November 1992. <laughs> Normalization and censorship The Warsaw Pact invasion included attacks on media establishments, such as Radio Prague and Czechoslovak Television, almost immediately after the initial tanks rolled into Prague on 21 August 1968. While both the radio station and the television station managed to hold out for at least enough time for initial broadcasts of the invasion, what the Soviets did not attack by force they attacked by reenacting party censorship. In reaction to the invasion, on 28 August 1968, all Czechoslovak publishers agreed to halt production of newspapers for the day to allow for a day of reflection for the editorial staffs. Writers and reporters agreed with Dubček to support a limited reinstitution of the censorship office, as long as the institution was to only last three months. Finally, by September 1968, the Czechoslovak Communist Party plenum was held to instate the new censorship law. In the words of the Moscow-approved resolution, "...the press, radio, and television are first of all the instruments for carrying into life the policies of the party and state." While this was not yet the end of the media's freedom after the Prague Spring, it was the beginning of the end. During November, the Presidium, under Husik, declared that the Czechoslovak press could not make any negative remarks about the Soviet invaders or they would risk violating the agreement they had come to at the end of August. When the weekly's reporter and Politica responded harshly to this threat, even going so far as to not so subtly criticize the Presidium itself in Politica, the government banned reporter for a month, suspended Politica indefinitely, and prohibited any political programs from appearing on the radio or television. The intellectuals were stuck at a bypass, they recognized the government's increasing normalization, but they were unsure whether to trust that the measures were only temporary or demand more. For example, still believing in Dubček's promises for reform, Milan Kundera published the article, Seski Udel, 
Our Czech Destiny in Literary Listy on the 19th of December. He wrote People who today are falling into depression and defeatism, commenting that there are not enough guarantees, that everything could end badly, that we might again end up in a marasmus of censorship and trials, that this or that could happen, are simply weak people, who can live only in illusions of certainty." In March 1969, however, the new Soviet-backed Czechoslovakian government instituted full censorship, effectively ending the hopes that normalization would lead back to the freedoms enjoyed during the Prague Spring. A declaration was presented to the Presidium condemning the media as co-conspirators against the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact in their support of Dubček's liberalization measures. Finally, on 2 April 1969, the government adopted measures to secure peace and order. Through even stricter censorship, forcing the people of Czechoslovakia to wait until the thawing of Eastern Europe for the return of a free media, former students from Prague, including Konstantin Mengus, and Czech refugees from the crisis, who were able to escape or resettle in Western countries continued to advocate for human rights, religious liberty, freedom of speech and political asylum for Czech political prisoners and dissidents. Many raised concerns about the Soviet Union and Red Army's continued military occupation of the Czechoslovakia in the 1970s and 1980s, prior to the fall of the Berlin Wall and collapse of communism in Moscow and Eastern Europe. Topic. Cultural impact The Prague Spring deepened the disillusionment of many Western leftists with Soviet views. It contributed to the growth of Eurocommunist ideas in Western Communist parties, which sought greater distance from the Soviet Union, and eventually led to the dissolution of many of these groups. A decade later, a period of Chinese political liberalization became known as the Beijing Spring. It also partly influenced the Croatian Spring in Communist Yugoslavia. In a 1993 Czech survey, 60% of those surveyed had a personal memory linked to the Prague Spring while another 30% were familiar with the events in another form. The demonstrations and regime changes taking place in North Africa and the Middle East from December 2010 have frequently been referred to as an Arab Spring. The event has been referenced in popular music, including the music of Carol Krill, Lubos Pfizer's Requiem, and Carol Hus's music for Prague 1968. The Israeli song, Prague, written by Shalom Hanich and performed by Eric Einstein at the Israel Song Festival of 1969, was a lamentation on the fate of the city after the Soviet invasion and mentions Jan Palach's self-immolation. They Can't Stop the Spring, a song by Irish journalist and songwriter John Waters, represented Ireland in the Eurovision Song Contest in 2007. Waters has described it as a kind of Celtic celebration of the Eastern European revolutions and their eventual outcome." Quoting Dubček's alleged comment, "...they may crush the flowers, but they can't stop the spring." The Prague Spring is featured in several works of literature. Milan Kundera set his novel The Unbearable Lightness of Being during the Prague Spring. It follows the repercussions of increased Soviet presence and the dictatorial police control of the population. A film version was released in 1988. The Liberators, by Viktor Suvorov, is an eyewitness description of the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia, from the point of view of a Soviet tank commander. Rock and Roll, a play by award-winning Czech-born English playwright Tom Stoppard, references the Prague Spring, as well as the 1989 Velvet Revolution. Hayda Margolius Kavala also ends her memoir Under a Cruel Star with a first-hand account of the Prague Spring and the subsequent invasion, and her reflections upon these events. In film there has been an adaptation of The Unbearable Lightness of Being, and also the movie Peliski from director Jan Rebeck and screenwriter Petr Jarchevsky, which depicts the events of the Prague Spring and ends with the invasion by the Soviet Union and their allies. The Czech musical film, Rebelove from Philip Rank, also depicts the events, the invasion and subsequent wave of emigration. The number 68 has become iconic in the former Czechoslovakia. Hockey player Jaromir Jager, whose grandfather died in prison during the rebellion, wears the number because of the importance of the year in Czechoslovak history. A former publishing house based in Toronto, 68 Publishers, that published books by exiled Czech and Slovak authors, took its name from the event. 
Topic anarchist analysis Anarchist Colin Ward argues that a significantly anarchist street culture developed during the Prague Spring as citizens became increasingly defiant of government authorities and began to occupy workplaces while creating mutual aid networks between telephone workers, truck drivers and university students. Furthermore, during the Soviet invasion, anarchists took to the streets and battled tanks and soldiers with rocks, Molotov cocktails and improvised weapons. Topic see also Velvet Revolution Croatian Spring Hungarian Revolution of 1956 Spring Revolutions Disambiguation Topic References Topic Bibliography Aspatrian, Vernon, Valenta, Yeri, Burke, David P. 1 April 1980. Eurocommunism Between East and West. Indiana Univ PR. ISBN 0-253-20248-5. Bischoff, Gunter, et al., eds. The Prague Spring and the Warsaw Pact Invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968 Lexington Books, 20100 510 pp. ISBN 978-0-7391-4304-9 Chaffetz, Glenn the 30th of April 1993. Gorbachev, Reform, and the Brezhnev Doctrine, Soviet Policy Toward Eastern Europe, 1985-1990. Prager Publishers. ISBN 0-275-94484-0. Christopher, Andrew, Mitrokin, Vasily The World Was Going Our Way, The KGB and the Battle for the Third World. Basic Books. ISBN 0-465-00311-7. Retrieved 9 October 2009. Cook, Bernard January 2001. Europe Since 1945, An Encyclopedia. Routledge. ISBN 0-8153-1336-5. Dispalatovic, Eleanor. Neighbors at War, Anthropological Perspectives on Yugoslav Ethnicity. Penn State Press. ISBN 0-271-01979-4. Retrieved 9 October 2009. Dubček, Alexander, Hockman, Yeri the 1st of January 1993. Hope Dies Last, The Autobiography of Alexander Dubček. Kodansha International. ISBN 1-56836-000-2. Ello, ed. Paul April 1968. Control Committee of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, Action Plan of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia Prague, April 1968 in Dubček's Blueprint for Freedom, his original documents leading to the invasion of Czechoslovakia. William Kimber & Co. 1968 Fawkes, Ben the 29th of August 2000. Eastern Europe 1945-1969, From Stalinism to Stagnation. Longman. ISBN 0-582-32693-1. Retrieved 9 October 2009. Franck, Thomas M. Nation Against Nation, What Happened to the UN Dream and What the U.S. Can Do About It, Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19-503587-9. Gortz, Gary, the 27th of January 1995. Contexts of International Politics. Cambridge University Press. ISBN 0-521-46972-4. Gorbachev, Mikhail, Malinar, Zdenek, the 8th of October 2003. Conversations with Gorbachev on Perestroika, the Prague Spring, and the Crossroads of Socialism. Columbia University Press. ISBN 0-231-11865-1. Gorbanevskaya, Natalia Red Square at Noon. Holt, Reinhardt and Winston. ISBN 0-03-085990-5. Grenville, J.A.S. A History of the World from the 20th to the 21st Century. Routledge. ISBN 0-415-28955-6. Hermann, Konstantin 2008. Zoxen und der Prager Frühling. Buka, Sachs Verlag. ISBN 0-415-28955-6. Jute, Tony the 5th of October 2005. Post-War, A History of Europe Since 1945. Penguin Press. ISBN 1-59420-065-3. Judicala, Eino, Perinen, Kauko 2001. Suomen Historia History of Finland. ISBN 80-7106-406-8. Kundera, Milan The Unbearable Lightness of Being. HarperCollins. 
ISBN 0 06 093213 9. Cousin, Vladimir. The 18th of July 2002. The Intellectual Origins of the Prague Spring: The Development of Reformist Ideas in Czechoslovakia 1956 to 1967. Cambridge University Press. ISBN 0 521 52652 3. Margolius Kavala, Haida. 1986. Under a Cruel Star: A Life in Prague 1941 to 1968. New York: Holmes and Meyer. ISBN 0-8419-1377-3. Morrison, Scott, Cherry, Don. The 26th of November 2006. Hockey Night in Canada: By the Numbers, from 00 to 99. Key Porter Books. ISBN 1-55263-984-3. Navizelskis, Ina. The 1st of August 1990. Alexander Dubček. Chelsea House Publications, Library Binding Edition. ISBN 1-55546-831-4. Navratil, Yaramir The 1st of April 2006. The Prague Spring 1968, a National Security Archive Document Reader National Security Archive Cold War Readers. Central European University Press. ISBN 963-7326-67-7. We Met, Matthew 2003. The Rise and Fall of the Brezhnev Doctrine in Soviet Foreign Policy. University of North Carolina Press, Chapel Hill and London. Ray, Kenneth September 1975. Peking and the Brezhnev Doctrine, Asian Affairs, 3 1. Skilling, Gordon H. 1976. Czechoslovakia's Interrupted Revolution. Princeton, Princeton University Press. Suvorov, Victor 1983. The Liberators. London, Hamilton, New English Library, Sevenoaks. ISBN 0-450-05546-9. Williams, Kieran The Prague Spring and its Aftermath, Czechoslovak Politics, 1968–1970. Cambridge University Press. ISBN 0-521-58803-0. Topic external links Czechoslovakia in 1968 Archive at Marxists. Org. Think Quest, The Prague Spring 1968 Radio Free Europe, a chronology of events leading to the 1968 invasion Prague Life, more information on the Prague Spring The Prague Spring, 40 years on, slideshow by the first post Victims of the invasion, a list of victims from the Warsaw Pact invasion with method of death Praha 1968 footage on YouTube.